Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions. I'm Pastor Summerall, the pastor of the Cathedral of Praise, and thank you for the privilege of getting to be with you again today. We want to get started right away with Psalms 136, verse 17. And could I read to you again from the New Living Translation? I just love doing the New Living Translation in the book of Psalms. Now, this is kind of a fun psalm, all right? Verse 17. Give thanks to him who struck down mighty kings. His faithful love endures forever. He killed powerful kings. His faithful love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, his faithful love endures forever. O Og, king of Bashan, his faithful love endures forever. God gave the land of these kings as an inheritance. His faithful love endures forever. A special possession to his servant Israel. His faithful love endures forever. Now, Forgive me, but all he's doing is reciting all the things that God did and then just saying, his faithful love endures forever. He remembered us in our weaknesses. His faithful love endures forever. He saved us from our enemies. His faithful love endures forever. He gives food to every living creature. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His faithful love endures forever. I said, well, pastor, what do you learn from that? I learn a beautiful way that I love to pray. You come before the Father in a time of thanksgiving, just to give thanks. And you come before him and, Father, I thank you. I thank you for how you have provided for me. Your faithful love endures forever. I thank you for that promotion that you gave me. Your faithful love endures forever. I thank you for healing my body. Your faithful love endures forever. I thank you for how you touched and healed my wife from cancer. Your faithful love endures forever. I thank you, Father, for the car that you have given me. Your faithful love endures forever. I thank you for the privilege of serving you. Your faithful love endures forever. I thank you for my home. Your faithful love endures forever. Do you get the point? What a beautiful way to pray. You know, it's kind of like count his blessings, name them one by one. Do you remember the old song we sang when we were young? Only this time, instead of just reciting the blessings, after each blessing, after each answered prayer, after each miracle that you remember that he has done for you, you say his faithful love endures forever. Beloved, we are a very blessed people. To have a God who loves us, to have a God who cares for us, to have a God that the scripture says, faithful is he who has promised. Learn to spend more time giving thanks. I will tell you that as I get older, I have to be honest with you, I don't spend a lot of time praying about needs. Okay, I don't spend a lot of time praying about things. Once in a while, if something comes up, okay. But the more I look back across my life, the more I just step back and thank you, Father. Your faithful love endures forever. Thank you, Father. The steadfast love of God endures forever. Amen. Let's open up our hearts and spend some time in worship now.
Our Old Testament passage today picks up with the book of Hosea, chapter 3, verse 1. Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethish of barley. And I said to her, now in other words, Hosea goes and buys back his wife. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days and you shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. And afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. <laughs> oh, oh. There is a day coming when the children of Israel will return and seek their God. But for many days, and these are the days that we're living in right now, Israel does not have a king or prince. There is no sacrifice. There is no pillar. There is no ephod. There are no household gods. These are barren times for Israel. But they shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in latter days. I wish you could be with me in Israel at a soccer match where the people of Israel begin to sing a song about the return of, the return of Messiah. And you see 30,000 people or however many that stadium holds right by the big shopping mall singing about the coming of the Messiah. There is something happening in Israel today. Something powerful is happening. I just had an old friend who's a Jew, and he's a wonderful friend and a good friend. And he, he sent me a text message the other day. The Messiah is coming soon. I just sat there with tears coming down my face. Israel, if you want to see the great, I don't even know what to call it, you want to see where all of prophecy culminates? Go look at Israel. See what is happening there. Jesus is coming soon. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. Now notice the word of the Lord. This is prophecy. This is not the words of men. This is the word of the Lord. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Now that's a strong statement. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. Wow. Now notice the controversy is not with the land. It's with the inhabitants of the land, with the people. So among the people, there's no faithfulness, there's no steadfast love, and there's no knowledge, no knowledge of God. In the land. Now, again, this isn't referring to the land, it's referring to the inhabitants of the land. What there is in the land, there is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing adultery. They break all bounds. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. All right, so what is in the land? Or we can say what people are doing. Not, not what, there's no faithfulness, there's no steadfast love, there's no knowledge, but people are swearing, people are lying, people are murdering, they're stealing, they're committing adultery, they're breaking all bounds. Now, let me read that to you from the New Living Translation real quick. New Living says, you make vows and break them. So there, there's no there's no bounds. There's no there's no keeping of your word anymore. Therefore, and here's a big one, therefore the land mourns. Now notice the land. This is this is the ground. And all who dwell in it languish. 
all who dwell in it languish. Also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, even the fish of the she are taken away. Now notice, sin destroys the land. Now, brothers and sisters, do you want the Philippines to be a productive land with wonderful forests and wonderful agriculture and wonderful abundance of animals and livestock and fish? Uh, the land languishes because of the sin, because of the swearing, the lying, the murder, the stealing, the committed adultery, the breaking all bonds, not keeping vows, bloodshed following bloodshed. He said, listen, the land mourns. You, you look at abortion, killing millions of babies. There are many nations of the world that kill over a million babies a year. The land mourns. The land, you have to understand the sin of man. And here's the principle. The sin of man affects the land. Now, please, I'm not anti-climate change, all right? Please, I'm not anti any of that stuff. I don't know what to think about all that. But I do know what to think about this. There are people that are so worried about polluting the environment. And you know what? We shouldn't. We, we should not pollute the environment. We should, have, we should be good stewards with the land. But at the same time, these same people who teach, you know, climate change and they teach, you know, anti-pollution, they're murdering babies. I mean, you know, murdering, the stealing, the lying, the swearing. You know, you, you listen to a guy who's, you, you, you listen to a mob of people that are, are promoting um, laws to protect the environment. And you see the F word, every other word. And you go, all right, so they're swearing. Huh. All of that affects the land. The spiritual and the spiritual actions of mankind affects the land. Yet let no one contend and let no one accuse, for it is with you is my contention, O priest. All right. Now God says, This is my contention. So God's problem is with the preachers. You shall stumble by day, the prophet shall also stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people, here's one of the famous verses in the Bible, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will reject you from being priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of God, I will forget your children. Now, God begins to speak against the preachers. Now, now pastors, please, I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. But when you see sin rampant in a nation, it's because we as pastors are not doing our jobs. You know, we can stand up and say the politicians aren't doing their jobs and we need laws for this and that. You know what? Laws have never changed the nation in the history of the world. What changes the nation is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's getting people born again. It's preaching the gospel. That's what brings about a change in the nation preaching the gospel and teaching people the word of God. He said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. When people aren't taught the Bible, the knowledge of God, that's what brings destruction to the people. And he said, because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you. This is called reaping. He said, as a preacher, if you reject knowledge, you know, I know many preachers that don't want to study. They want other people to write their sermons and all they want to do is be a presenter. You know, they're going to present what somebody else writes. They're going to present what somebody else says. They get their sermons off of the great God Google rather than on their knees in prayer. And, and he's, God says, when you reject knowledge, I'll reject you as a priest for me. Now, people like to say, you know, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Um, that verse is so taken out of context. And so wrongly applied. God rejects priests who have rejected knowledge. Preachers, you better get a hold of that one. If there's one thing a preacher should do, it must be to study. Paul said, Timothy, study to show yourself approved of God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Let's put that verse in here. We'll go look it up and put it in there later. Study to show yourself approved.
And he said, and since you have forgotten the law of God, I will also forget your children. Now here is a reason for PK's destruction. PK means preacher's kids. You know, preacher's kids are so spoken against in the world. <laughs> in fact, you know, there's even been songs written about him. The only man that could ever move me was the son of a preacher man. In other words, he was so sinful. He was so sexually sinful. Now, now that's a horrible thing to say. But God said, when, when preachers forget the law of God, God says, I'll forget your children. He said, you don't take care of my children. I'm not going to take care of your children. I tell every pastor, do you want your children to have a good life? Yes. Then take care of the children of God. The more they increase, and here's a big thought, the more they increase, the more they sinned against me. And God said, I will turn their glory into shame. Wow. So, preachers, sin increases with number of preachers. Why? <laughs> Competition. Preachers are competing for a crowd. And so the more they sin against God because they're competing for a crowd. Now, why are they competing for a crowd? They feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. Wow. They feed on the sin of the people. The thing that enriches them is the sin of the people. You know, just come to church. It doesn't matter about your sinfulness. It doesn't matter that, you know, you've got a number two, a number three, a number 25. Just, just make sure you bring me your tithe. I'll, I'll come and collect your tithe every week. They feed on the sin. They enrich themselves on the sin of the people. They're greedy for their iniquity. Again, greedy for the people's sin. Wow. And it shall be like people, like priests. In other words, the preachers follow the people's lifestyle. Now, how many times has Paul said, follow my pattern of life, my conduct? But they, they didn't follow the pattern of the leaders. The leaders followed the people. He said, I will punish them for their ways and I will repay them. Now, there's a couple of big words. Punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. This is a promise to preachers. They shall eat but not be satisfied. They shall play the whore but shall not multiply because they have forsaken the Lord to cherish. Wow. These are the preachers. They cherish whoredom, wine, new wine, which takes away the understanding. <laughs> Sin removes understanding. No wonder they can't preach well. No wonder they can't put two thoughts together. No wonder they have no real understanding of Scripture. The whoredom, the sexual immorality, that wine and the new wine takes away understanding. Hmm. Now that's all about preachers. So this is a really hard section on preachers. My people inquire of a piece of wood. That's an idol. And their walking staff gives them oracles. <laughs> now, the walking staff is like a piece, a tall piece of st a stick that you walk with to stable you on the rocky ground. He said, you inquire of a piece of wood. And he said, the stick that you used to walk with Gives them prophecies? <laughs> For a, the spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the whore. Now, again, that's referring to idolatry as well as sexual immorality. But notice the spirit of whoredom has led them astray. There's, there's a demon spirit behind all this. They sacrifice on the tops of mountains. Here's the idolatry and burnt offerings on the hills under oak, poplar, terebinth, because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters play the whore and your brides commit adultery. Wow. The fruit of idolatry 
equals sexually immoral children. Now that's hard, okay? The fruit of idolatry is sexually immoral children. I will not punish your daughters when they play the whore, nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes, and a people without understanding shall come to ruin. All right, he said, you want me to punish the daughters and the brides? But he said, what about the men? He said, you know, you don't like it when, when the ladies do this. But he said, look what the men are doing. So here's the daughters. Here's the brides. But he said, now listen, the men are doing the same thing. Though you play the whore, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. Enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to Bethavon, and swear not as the Lord lives. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? <laughs> No. Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him, leave him alone. When their drink is gone, they give themselves to whoring, and their rulers dearly love shame. This is the culture. When their drink is gone, they give themselves to whoring, and their rulers dearly love shame. They love shame the shame. They love the sin. A, ma, a wind is wrapped them in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Chapter 5. Hear this, O priests. Now again, we're writing to the preachers. Pay attention, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king. So here's priests, here's the people, and here's the king. And again, this is the ten tribes. For judgment is for you, for you have been a snare to mitzvah and a net spread upon Tabor. And revolters have gone deep into slaughter, but I will discipline all of them. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, Ephraim, you have played the whore. Israel is defiled. Their deeds do not permit them. Now, here, here is just an amazing thought. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God, for the spirit of whoredom is within them, and they know not God. Man, that's a wow. You know, when, when you, you get this spirit within you, the, their deeds do not permit them to return, for the spirit there's a demon spirit of whoredom that's gotten inside of them. It, you know, I, I talked with a man one time, and he had been horribly sexual and moral beyond a normal, even a bad guy's comprehension. And he just said, you know, I can't help myself. I just have to go do this. And he said, you know, I have what they call a sexual addiction. I said, no, you don't have a sexual addiction. You have a sexual demon that you need to be set free from. Oh. So this is possession. So when people talk about sexual addictions, I talk about sexual possessions. Demon spirits of whoredom. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Israel and Ephraim shall stumble in his guilt. Judah also shall stumble with them. With their flocks and herds, they go to seek the Lord. They go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn from them. Now notice, their deeds do not permit them to return to the Lord. Now, they might go seeking, but they're not wanting to return. You see, there are a lot of people that they want to be around God, but they don't want to return to God, okay? They want to hang out with God, but not repent. Okay, they have dealt faithlessly with the Lord. Now, how do you, there's no sincerity. All right, so no sincerity. There's no sincerity. They've dealt faithlessly with the Lord, for they have borne alien children 
Now the new moon shall devour them in their fields. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Sound the alarm in beth Aven. We will follow you, O Benjamin. Ephraim has become a desolation in the day of punishment. Among the tribes of Israel, I will make known what is sure. Wow. God's work. He said, you know what? I will make known what is sure. The princes of Judah have become like those who move the landmark. Wow. Upon them I will pour out my wrath like water. In other words, you're stealing land from people. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment because he was determined to go after filth. Wow. Can you imagine that? Determined to go after filth. You know, there are people that are just determined to go after filth. They're determined to go after pornography. They're determined to go after sexual immorality. And I'm not even talking about just the, the, the normally bad kind. I'm talking about the worst of the worst. They're determined. I am like a moth to Ephraim and like dry rot to the house of Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went up to Assyria and sent to the great king. But he is not able to cure you or heal your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off and no one shall rescue. For I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. God withdrew until one, two, three. Now, straight up challenge, if that's talking to you, if you've just stubbornly gone after your sin and you feel like God has pulled back from your life, he may have. But notice, until, there's a big until there. God never takes away hope until you acknowledge your guilt, you seek his face, and in your distress, earnestly seek him. And when you do that, <laughs> God is good and his mercy endures forever. All right, let's open up our hearts and spend some more time in worship. Seven night went to the little land. Way up in the sky, little lamb. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? A star, a star, dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite. With a tail as big as a kite. Shepherd boy, do you hear what I hear? Do you hear what I hear? Ringing through the sky, Shepherd boy, do you hear what I hear? Do you hear what I hear? A song, a song, high above the tree, with the boy to the mighty king. Do you know what I know? Do you know what I know? In your palace swamp, mighty king. Well, do you know what I know? Do you know what I know? A child, a child, shivers in the cold. Let us bring him silver and Yes. 
Our New Testament reading today picks up with 2 John. Now, 2 John is probably written by John on the island of Patmos, okay, where he wrote the book of Revelation from. And when it talks about the elect lady, this is probably how he is talking about the local church, because the local church is called the Bride of Christ. All right, so let's get into this. The elder, he calls himself the elder. He is considered an elder in the church. Now, remember the concept of elder, which is presbyteros and bishop and shepherd. All of these are synonymous terms we see from the book of Acts. I think it's chapter 18, chapter 19. The elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth. So notice the children of the local church. These are the members. The members are are the children, whom I love in truth. Not only I, but also all who know the truth. All right, so everybody, all believers, love believers. Because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace. All right, the grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. So grace, mercy, and peace is with us, from the Father and from the Son. He said, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. So he said, you've got church members who are walking in truth. Now, that is that is a joy. This is, this is a pastor's joy. When you see people walking in truth, not not off, you know, walking in compromise, not off walking in false doctrine, but walking in truth, just as we are commanded by the Father. Now, remember, walk in the Bible means to live. So living in truth. Now, that is a pastor's joy. I, you know, I've looked at members and I look at people that I've watched in the church, some of them for 40 years, over 40 years now. But the same thing is true with young people today. When you see young people that have really made a commitment to God and they're really living right, that is what causes a pastor to rejoice. Sometimes as pastors, we deal so much with people who are stumbling and falling, and we deal so much with rebellion and everything else. But to see people walking in truth, that that puts a smile on your face all day long. When you watch somebody standing up for righteousness, when you watch a young person, you know, forgive me, losing opportunities because they chose to follow Jesus, when you see people just living the life and walking in truth, that's what brings great joy to a pastor. And now I ask you, dear lady, uh, make that in blue. He said, now I ask you, dear lady. Now remember, dear lady is the local church. Not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one that we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Now, now here's this constant phrase, that we love one another. He said, this is the commandment we've had from the beginning. And not just the beginning with Jesus. Jesus said, this is the greatest commandment. And you go back and remember when we went through Deuteronomy, we kept seeing that, that this is the commandment, love that you love one another. Wow. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. All right, here's that concept of walk again, that we live according to his commandments. And this is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should 
walk in it. So here's walk again. Now, notice why he keeps talking about how to live. The reason now flows. For or because. Many deceivers. Not a few. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. He said, you know, you just look around. Now, now remember, we are now in about 90 AD, all right? We're around 90 AD. So we're about 60 plus years after the cross. And in this one generation, many deceivers have gone out into the world. And he says, those who do not confess the coming of the Lord Jesus in the flesh. He says, such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist. All right, now, who is a deceiver? An antichrist simply means against the anointed one. Who is that? A person who does not confess the coming of Jesus in the flesh. Now, there was a, one of the early heresies in the early church, something called doceticism. Let's see if I can remember how to spell it correctly. D-O-C-E-T-I-S-I-M. Doceticism. And that early, that's an E, that early heresy said that Jesus looked like a human being, but Jesus was not a human being. So in other words, they denied the virgin birth. So there are people in those early heresies that not only denied the resurrection, but they denied the virgin birth. They had this idea that Jesus looked like a human, but he wasn't really human. Now, if that's true, then he's not our high priest. He's not the faithful high priest who has been tempted in all things just as we are. So this is a heresy, all right? This is a deception, and this is someone who is against, anti-Messiah, anti-the anointed one. He said, watch yourselves. Now, this, this is how you stand up against false doctrine, okay? How to overcome false doctrine. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Now, in other words, if you don't, if you don't overcome the work in their life is lost, everything that, that leaders have done in your life is lost. And <laughs> no full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching, teaching of Christ, does not have God. Whoever abides or lives in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Now, whoever goes on ahead, now let me show that to you in the NLT. Anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God. Now, that's what it means to go on ahead. You, you wander ahead. You want to move ahead of the teaching. The, the teaching isn't juicy enough. The teaching isn't deep enough. So you want to get out into these, these new things that, that aren't true. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive them in your house or give them any greeting. All right. So how do you overcome false doctrine? A, check the teaching. Does it line up with the word or does it just sound new? And number two, do not receive them. And number three, do not greet them. Now, I know in Christianity, people don't like to hear this. But if you're going to stay away from false doctrine, when you, you see people and they're getting off 
he doesn't say to befriend them. He says, don't receive them. He doesn't say to befriend them. He said, don't even give them a greeting. Right? Now, brothers and sisters, you have to understand, when people get into false doctrine, and I'm not talking about just little differences in teaching. I'm talking about things that will affect people's relationship with God. When people start getting into stuff that affects your relationship with God, he said, don't even greet them. Now, if, you, if you're going to keep your doctrines right, if you're going to abide in the teaching and not get into false doctrine, this is how to do it. Listen to the teaching. Does it line up with the word or are they just getting off into, into weird stuff? Now, if it's getting off into weird stuff and it's stuff that can affect your relationship with God, you know, there are some things in the Bible that definitely do show your relationship with God. People always want to talk about, Pastor Summerall, you teach tithing too strong. No, tithing is all about a man's relationship with God. It, it shows his submission to God's authority or, or her submission to God's authority. So when you start getting into things like anything that affects people's relationship with God, and you listen to their teaching, and they're off, don't receive them, and don't even greet them. Now, I know people will hate me for saying things like that, but you know what? I want you to go to heaven, and I want to go to heaven. And there are many people that I've known that when I listen to them and I listen to their, their weird, you know, they're really getting off into some heresy. They're getting off into things that will destroy people's personal relationship with God. Like I listened to a preacher one time say there is no such thing as personal worship. You know what? I won't even receive that guy into my house. Wow. When I hear people say, you don't need to read the Bible, just listen to me and read my books. I don't ever want to hear them again. You see, anything that would cause me not to abide in the teachings of Christ, I don't want to hear. Now, if somebody's going to, you know, have a difference of theology of, of, you know, different little doctrines, like somebody's going to be post-trib or mid-trib or no-trib, you know, or pre-trib rapture or amillennialist, you know, th these aren't things that are going to tear up people's salvation. So fine, we just, we just love people, all right? But anything that's going to affect someone's personal relationship with God, you check the teaching, and then you do not receive them, and you do not give them any greeting, just stay away. Now again, you can hate me for it, but that's what the scripture says. Whoever greets him takes part in his wicked deeds. And I just put a big wow next to that. If I, if I greet them and I give credibility, see, because when you greet them, you are giving credibility. Now, when I greet them and give them my credibility, I'm taking part in their wicked works. And these are wicked works. Any, any propagation or any pushing of a doctrine that does not, that, that will in any way hinder people's relationship with God that's a wicked work. He said, though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. Now, why is joy complete? <laughs> you minister face to face. That this is, you, say, well, you know, Pastor Summer, we have technology today. They had technology in their day also. Their technology was paper and ink. But you know what? With paper and ink, I hate writing people letters. I'm so glad we can just do a FaceTime call. I'm so glad for telephones. Because when you write a letter, people can't hear your tone of voice. They can't see the expression on your face. They can't look at you and feel the heart of love that you have for them. So when you, you start saying strong things, it's really easy for people to get offended by writing. But now, and you, some of you need to remember this with your Facebook, okay? Some of you really need to remember that with your Facebook. But talk face to face. This is where joy is made complete. The children of your elect sister, this is another local church. The children of your elect sister greet you. Let's turn our attention now to a little bit of wisdom from the book of Proverbs. 
chapter 28, verse 5. And you notice how I always like to keep my NIV and my ESV together? It's a nice way to do it. ESV for the literal word-for-word -word translation, NLT for the smoothed over, and smooth not in a bad way, but kind of putting the words together and getting the meaning. Proverbs 28, verse 5. Evil men do not understand justice. Wow. Evil men do not understand justice. Now, you, you need to get a hold of that one just a little bit. Evil men do not understand justice. Now, they may cry out for, they may talk about, but they don't understand justice. Sin Sin blinds understanding. So what they are calling for for justice, forgive me, <laughs> they don't even comprehend. But those who seek the Lord understand it, justice, completely. All right, so seeking God, prayer, Bible, will allow you to understand justice. See, justice is not nuanced. Justice is very plain. Justice is very straight in your face. But sin in people's lives blinds their minds to understanding. They scream for justice, but they don't understand it. Better is a poor man. Better. So this is a list. Things better. Better a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Now, that's a beautiful passage. Every one of us at some point or another in our life is going to have to face, will I trade my integrity for money? Will I trade my integrity for money? Jesus, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world, Satan said. Bow down and worship me. But Jesus would not trade his integrity for money. Many times in life, I've walked away from what looked like opportunities. But when I looked at it, I saw a trap. And brothers and sisters, you say, well, you know, Pastor, how is it better to be poor? Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity because your integrity protects you. That's what it says about David in Psalm 78. His integrity, his transparency protected him. Now, why is that better? Because that is a life that God will bless. And forgive me, it's much better to be blessed by God than blessed by corrupt people who want you to join them in their corruption. The one who keeps the law is a son of understanding, but a companion of gluttons shames his father. Well, young people who obey the law are wise. Those with wild friends bring shame to their parents. Yeah. Young people, you want, you want to make your parents happy? No wild friends. Income from charging high interest rates will end up in the pocket of someone who is kind to the poor. Whoever multiplies his wealth by interest and profit gathers it for him who is generous to the poor. Now, there are some people that would take this and, and use it to say it's wrong to make a profit. No, I don't think that's what this is talking about. I think that you need to understand that there are people that you do business with that you can charge a fair price to. That's fair. But then there are other people that you see that, forgive me, you can't charge a fair price to. Why? Because they have nothing. And you're blessed. So you know what? You don't have to make a profit on everybody. And you don't have to make interest on everybody. What you do need to do is be generous to the poor. Okay, be generous to the poor. Because if you're not, and you take from the poor, one day, all that wealth you've gathered up is going to be put into the pocket of someone who's kind to the poor. Now, Christians, straight up talk. Those of you in business, you're selling, you don't have to make a big profit off every deal. Make your, make your fair profits, yes. But if you see that somebody is hurting and they come up and you know, their, their money's a little short. Say they're coming to you in the market, you have a stall in the market, and their, their money is 10 or 15 pesos short of, of getting what they need to buy. You know what? Just forget it. Just ha -ha. take it, take it, take it. 
You don't have to make a profit on everybody. Remember that. That is wisdom that will bring blessing and prosperity to your family. How you treat other people is how God will make sure you're treated. Amen? Every one of us at some point or another in our life is going to face need. And it's always nice to have sowed kindness to people who can't pay you back, who can't afford what they need to buy from you. So you sell it to them, sometimes at a loss. And God brings blessing to you. Amen. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. sharp for morning devotions. Mm -hmm.